we slaughter animals in slaughterhouses using mechanisms and using devices that wouldn't exist in the natural world and don't exist in the natural world. If, if you want to eat natural food, then good luck because it's going to be really hard to do that and also impossible on a population wide scale. So we need an unnatural element to our food system because that's how we can produce enough food to feed everyone. Ed, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the PBM Podcast. It is episode three. Absolutely. Thank you, Robbie, for having me back yet again. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, we're here to talk about your amazing new book, How to Argue with a Meat Eater and Win Every Time. Yeah. Very, very exciting. Tell us a little bit about how the idea for this book came along and how does it lead on from your first book? Well, when I was writing the first book um, and we were, myself and the publishing team were discussing titles, we had this title, How to Argue with a Meat Eater. And um, we were kind of umming and ahhing about it. And it didn't work for the first book. It wasn't suitable for the contents of the first book. But in the back of my mind, I was like, well, I, I can absolutely see what book this is. It was almost writing itself through the title. So when, when I got offered a second book, it, it was just there in front of me. Let's write how to argue with a meat eater. Um, because obviously through the years where I've been advocating for veganism, I've had the, the, the privilege, if that's the word. Sometimes it's not been so... Uh, doesn't feel so privileged, but the privilege to be able to speak to so many people about this issue um, across a you know, wide spectrum of different um, backgrounds, beliefs from farmers, ranchers, hunters to everyday consumers, you know, in the UK, America, wherever it may be. And so I've had an opportunity to discuss veganism a lot and also have a lot of my arguments stress tested and, you know, had lots of opportunities to try different forms of communication to see what works and what resonates and hopefully what's impactful. And so the idea behind this book was kind of twofold. The first thing was to really address all the different arguments against veganism and then show why they don't hold up, why they lack veracity. Yeah. And then the, uh, the second one was really to empower readers, you know, predominantly vegans as well, of course, to feel more confident and capable in their conversations. Because I strongly believe that the issue we have as advocates is not a message issue. We've got the science, we've got the logic, we've got the, the morality. When you look at it objectively, there isn't really an argument besides, besides maybe some practicality arguments around why someone wouldn't be vegan. But when you then look at the state of the world, the question becomes, well, why is it that more people aren't vegan? And I think there's so many reasons for that. But one of the most problematic things that we face as vegans is not how to, oh, sorry, not what to say, but how to say it. Mm. Because I think often we have an optics problem and often we can be our own worst enemy in mm. these conversations. So it's not just about knowing, you know, what to say, what the arguments are, but importantly, how do we get these arguments across in a way that brings people on board rather than alienates them and pushes them away? Yeah, the, the, what's interesting about those points is the evolution of the argument. When we initially encounter this lifestyle, which often feels completely at odds with everything we see around us, we go out in the street, we see billboards advertising meat, we're at school, we see it in you know, in the canteen, we we're at university, it's everywhere, you know, it's, it's become such a, well, it's always been a part of our lives, you know, and especially in, in this part of the world. And so to be vegans and sort of in, emerge into this very carnistic world for many is a shock. Mm. People go through this sort of traumatic phase. Um, we've touched it, uh, touched on it before in the past, but I'd love to hear about your evolution. Like, where did you start and tell us how you where where you are now? Because the way that you talk, uh, about this issue has evolved considerably over time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, how has that changed you as a person? Because obviously, you know, it has it has obviously affected your life. It's obviously opened up a world to you. As you say, you, you've spoken to so many different people. If anyone has seen your YouTube channels, some of the people that you do speak to are incredibly challenging. Um, but talk us through that process and that evolution that you've had, which has obviously culminated in this kind of I guess, almanac of arguments. <laughs> right, yes, that's a nice phrase. I like that. Um, I think the first thing is to think before I was vegan, I was, I wouldn't say staunchly against veganism, but certainly wasn't on board with it. And I used to think the vegans were weird and militant and extreme and were really not likable and certainly not aspirational. And so I think what I learned quickly when I started advocating for veganism is that, you know, I'm appealing to people like who I used to be. Mm. And if I used to have this impression of vegans, how is my advocacy technique reflecting on that type of person? I think about who I was, you know, pretty stubborn, pretty, um, you know, insular, maybe not, you know, thinking too broadly about these issues in my day-to-day -day life. So what would have worked for me? And I, and I think when I first started my vegan advocacy, the intention was good, you know, 
but sometimes the delivery wasn't so good. Mm. Um, language, the, um, the body language, the, the tone, the accusational language, the judgmental language. And I think I quickly realized that when I was having conversations, I was ultimately failing with my one objective. Mm. And if I'm saying to myself, hey, I'm an advocate, and so my role, my job, if you like, is to bring people on board and is to make people feel more favorably about veganism. But at the end of these conversations, the opposite has been achieved. Well, I shouldn't be doing this job mm. or I need to change. And so I think there is an element of accountability we have to hold over ourselves because if we're putting ourselves in the position where we're advocating on behalf of someone else, because you know we're advocating on behalf of animals mm. in these situations, if we fail to be able to do that in a meaningful or effective way, then perhaps we're causing more harm than good. And I had that kind of harsh conversation with myself mm. and, um, and kind of evolved from there and realized that, you know, asking questions, uh, encouraging people to reflect on their behaviors, you know, asking people to tell me how they feel rather than telling them how I feel. Mm. All of these things kind of evolved over time. And the more I did them, the, the better I felt about it. Mm. And there's a certain irony, I suppose, which is the longer I've been vegan, the more I've come to understand why people aren't. And you'd, you'd feel that maybe the longer you were vegan, the more frustrated and annoyed and, and um, judgmental you'd, you'd become. But I think the inverse is true because you have that initial phase where you're very angry, you're very upset, and you think, well, if only people just knew this, they would obviously change. You know, mm. I just need to tell them and then they'll get it. And that doesn't happen because that's not how the human mind works or how you know human psychology operates. And so then you, then you then have to adapt and you then have to try and meet people where they're at. And I think sometimes as advocates, we have this belief that being understanding or empathetic to, towards why people aren't vegan is somehow a bad thing. Mm. Like we're somehow letting the animals down right. or we're somehow misrepresenting our position because we need to let everyone know just how serious that is. Mm. But actually I think the opposite is true. I think the understanding and empathy allows us to bring people on board and actually yep. allows us to achieve our aims in a, in a much more effective way. Mm, absolutely. One of my favorite references about ideas and um, and kind of com conversing and sharing knowledge is is using the fictional film um, Inception. And we maybe talked about this in the last episode where you know, the human mind is built in such a way that it has protective mechanisms around core beliefs. Right. Yes. And that if we approach a person with aggressive body language or an aggressive tone of voice, we have evolved as a species to protect our core beliefs. You know, if we didn't have these mechanisms in place, you could tell people to jump off cliffs and they would listen to you if you were a person of influence. Now, um, what's fascinating about the evolution of the argument and, and the process that you've been through and the process that many advocates go through is understanding that, you know, meeting a person where they're at and, as you say, building a sense of compassion and connection with them isn't about being an apologist or making excuses for them, but it's about creating a framework with which you can have a level playing field where the person feels, I guess, confident and uh, secure to be able to open up to you and to talk to you because you're never going to be able to create that inception, you know, plant the idea in the mind of the other person and let it germinate and blossom if the defense mechanisms are always going to get in the way. Uh, and I think ego plays a big role in this, doesn't it? You know, if we feel a sense of superiority in every single conversation we have with others, we never allow the other person to be imperfect or to evolve because, you know, we stand on our pedestal, we look down on others and we sort of, you know, communicate in the way we communicate. We might be waving our arms, we might be getting angry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the conversation was always going to end badly. But what's so fascinating about, you know, like the Socratic method and asking questions rather than telling people what to do, you know, you're drawing that response out of someone in such a, um, you know, a way that allows for them to come to it on their own rather than you forcing it on them, right. which is can it requires a lot of patience. <laughs> Certainly so. Patience is the name of the game in many ways, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I, th I think there is, there is this expectation that we place on ourselves to be able to change people's minds and hearts mm. in a very quick period of time. Yeah. But I think one thing that I've always found empowering is to think about my journey and the, the the catalysts that I've had throughout the years that have encouraged me to change. Because we might think of like one moment, oh, I watched Earthlings or I saw this factory farm footage and that's what made me go vegan. But th there's a whole series of events that have led up to the point where you've watched Earthlings. Mm. You know, why did you want to watch it in the first place? Many what seeds. Many seeds. And so we should view our role as not being 
the final catalyst, let's say, but but a part of that process, the planting of the seed at some some way along that journey for these people so that maybe they themselves feel intrigued to, to research it on their own. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about setting fair and um, achievable expectations for ourselves and then making sure we go about that in a way that is going to accomplish those goals as mm -hmm. effectively as we possibly can. Yeah. Before we dive into the actual arguments themselves, the almanac of arguments, there, there <laughs> it is again. Dead, um, we let's look at like how do people acquire their beliefs and views. We live in a society which is heavily dominated and controlled by media, by advertising, by the education system, and all of these pillars of the monolith, as I like to call it, prop up this carnistic and uh, speciesist world that we live in. Right. They maintain the hierarchical structures that hold this edifice this um monolith in place um and so you know how do we it seems so it seems so enormous we were early talking earlier talking about the budgets that like mcdonald's have for example for their marketing 400 million dollars a year yeah they have you know, there, there are times where we think it can be incredibly overwhelming as individuals. We don't have those kinds of budgets to work with, but what we do have is the truth on our side. But when we say the word truth and we talk about like facts, it, often when we communicate in this way in truth, truths and in facts, people don't listen. They don't want to believe you because they're so heavily influenced by misinformation and disinformation. Um, I'd love to talk a bit about the role of misinformation in our society, especially on social media. Untrue information travels, according to a study by Twitter, six times faster than true information because of the way it's packaged up. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on, on misinformation and how it maintains it, this sort of echo chambers. You know, people get caught in these rabbit warrens of like misinformation and at the bottom in this kind of pit at the bottom is an echo chamber where people yeah. then get stuck. Um, how, firstly, you know, what are you, is your views and your experience of misinformation and combating it through your platform? But also what are your theories on how we get people out of these very dark rabbit holes? Mm, it's hard. The second part of that question is, is very hard. Um, my experience sadly is daily. Mm. I mean, every single day I hear it, read it, have it said to me, misinformation about the healthfulness of plant-based diets, the environmental impact of plant-based diets, it drives me mad. I was watching a, a Piers Morgan thing the other day, which is never advisable, <laughs> obviously. Um, not for your blood pressure. <laughs> certainly not. And uh, he was discussing about how, um, you know, plant foods are transported. Mm. He said, you, you know, you fly your plant foods all around the world. I'm right. like, that, that's not true. I mean, they're, they're transported by boats, mm. almost mm. overwhelmingly always yeah. transported by boats. But there's just this, this narrative that's perpetuated constantly about different things. Mm. Um, and it's overwhelming because most of the time we end up in conversations where we're having to defend ourselves against false information. It's like a game of ping pong. Right. Yes. Yeah. Except less fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it is so frustrating to have to constantly say, no, that's not true. This is yeah. why that's not true. Yeah. You know, and then even if you say this is why it's not true, people go, well, I don't believe you. Yeah. Because the word truth, what, what, what does it mean anymore to people? Mm. Everyone decides what's true, you know, mm. rather than critically reflecting to discover what is true. And I think that we live in this very dangerous time where, where the, the positive of social media and the positive of having so much information is we can access mm -hmm. information that often we wouldn't have been able to before. But the downside to that is that it allows for misinformation and nefariously disinformation to spread so quickly that it's really hard for us to get what we want people to see in front of them. Mm. And then what you've got to add to that is that the way that misinformation works so effectively in this regard is it tells people what they want to hear. Mm. And that's why it's really hard to combat it because we're not just dealing with media and marketing and PR and consultancy propaganda. We're also dealing with the fact that people want to maintain the status quo. They enjoy the things that they're doing. Mm. And there's that idea of, of a pleasure pain principle where people make decisions to increase pleasure and decrease pain. And so if we're confronted with the reality that what happens to animals is terrible and it's bad for us and bad for the environment and we need to change, that's a much harder narrative to sell than, mm. oh, by the way, eating meat's good for you. Mm. Not only that, red meat's the best food you can eat and it's the best food for the environment and the animals are treated better than anyone else on the planet. All of a sudden that makes us feel very good. And so it's really hard to try and convince people that the opposite is true, even though the opposite is true. Mm. And how do we combat that? I mean, we have to try and you know, um, be there to, to respond to these arguments. We have to, as advocates, 
try as best as we can to have those responses at hand, even though it can be hard to know all the things we need to know, mm. try our best, and then just refute it in situations where we can. But at the same time, it's it's a very challenging battle. Mm. Um, and at times it can feel like we're losing it, and especially with this whole narrative about plant-based alternatives and and, and you know regenerative agriculture and all of these these relatively new arguments that have mm. sprung up in the past few years yeah. but are now dominating the narrative. Mm. They are one such uh, narrative is ultra plant, ultra processed yeah. equals mega unhealthy, and so you know you picture a street you walk on uh, along the, the sidewalk and you have a conversation with the average person and you say what do you think of vegan food and they say oh it's terribly processed it's very unhealthy I've heard. And you say, where did you hear that? And then they say, oh, the Daily Mail yes, or, yes, <laughs> or The Sun. Yeah. And, you know, and there's one thing that a lot of these uh, media outlets have in common is they're of, often connected to super spreaders, people who, uh, you know, as I like to, we like to call them in the misinformation world, people who are prone to spreading the large, largest amounts of misinformation. People like Piers Morgan, who is very good at arguing points, a lot of them completely invalid. He's a bit of an exception, I think, because I don't know whether he really believes the things that he right. argues. I think that he likes to make these points because he's a shock jock, as they say. He's a populist. He likes to create com uh, controversy. But take, you know, ultra process, for example. Let's let's talk about that as a piece of misinformation because there's so much nuance. Trouble with conversation and knowledge is that there is so much nuance in facts and terms and science and nutrition. And social media has re reduces everything down to a few characters in a comment section. Yeah. And I think what it's doing is it's priming human society to process information in tiny sound bites. And people become so lazy and so reluctant to really try to understand a subject from all sides. They will form an opinion based on a headline. You know, they'll read the Daily Mail, for example, last week. There was a headline that said, blow to veganism, nutrient found in meat and milk to protect many from many forms of cancer. Now, the average person will read the headline, a couple of the, you know, the line that the, the points underneath, which is obviously very damning to veganism. Do you think they'll read the article in detail, which talks about it being not as clear or no, they won't. They'll read the headline. They might read another headline. All it does is reinforce that belief and that view that, you know, a vegan diet is problematic. It's not good for health. And then they've seen something in another magazine. But then, you know, what we should be doing is going, okay, well, where, where's that research from? Who is the person who, who is the organization that funded that research? And in five minutes, I found that the research was funded by Pfizer. Pfizer has a major stake in animal agriculture. Um, you know, it's in their interest for this type of study to be published and pushed. And it's such a gray area, but it, all it does is it creates more bias within society. With the media being the way it is, I mean, you might it must you must find it incredibly frustrating that this is even allowed. That how uh, how is there no level or sense of accountability to be able to, I guess, attack a lifestyle that is so good for the planet that it dramatically reduces our greenhouse gas emissions in, as individuals? You know, it protects rivers, it protects forests. It's <laughs> there's just so much good that can come from people switching to a plant based diet. Yet the media seems to be dragging us down a very dark alley. You know, uh, how do we combat these organizations? How do we, you know, I, I can understand the conversations we can do one-to-one -one and we'll, we'll get onto the book in a sec. But I think like for me, as part of my work, which I'll be doing in the new year is, is tackling misinformation directly. What are the channels that we should be using to, to challenge these narratives? You know, can we as individuals challenge them? Do we have the power to do that? Well, I suppose the counterbalance to some of the, some of the ideas about media now is that we're in a situation where I suppose we do have access to an opposing perspective. Mm. If you go back 30, 40 years, yeah. even longer, people got their information from newspapers, uh, from the TV, but there wasn't necessarily a way to fact check that. Mm. So we, at least we do live in an age now where we have somewhat of an ability to fact check that we can right. find <laughs> the source material. We don't have to purchase a scientific journal to find mm. it in the journal. We can go online and access it often for free through um, public access websites and such. So it's, in a way, yes, it's scary how these these headlines run, but they've always been that way. It's just oh, yeah. at least now we have somewhat of an inclination that we should fact check things. Mm. But I think part of the problem is this this idea of um, critical reflection, 
we need to empower people to want to do that. Yes. But then you have to create scientific literacy in people. People have to be taught how to read papers. Media literacy, right? Media literacy as mm. well. So there are all of these complex things which were not taught very well in schools, if at all in schools. Mm. Um, and then we have to empower people to not only learn how to do some of these things, but then want to do these things. Mm. And then want to do these things with these articles, which they want to be true and don't necessarily want to have debunked <laughs> for them. So there are so many roadblocks in the way to getting people to go, oh, this is a bit of a clickbait headline. Mm. Let me read the full article. Yeah. Now let me see if there's there's, there's other forms of reporting going on. Mm. And now let's let me see what the scientific study says. And now let me read it. Now let me understand it. Now let me draw my own conclusions. Mm. It, it becomes heavy and a heavy does, task yeah. for people that are, are low on time, mm. low on desire in yeah. this situation. And so th then that means that the responsibility is placed somewhat on us to kind right. of not, not play the same game because we don't want to be reductive and create headlines that do the same thing. We don't want to manipulate people in a way that's reductive. But we also have to play a similar game, which is we need to grab people's attention. We need to get this information in front of them as simply as possible. And we have to do so in a way that makes them realize that, well, it makes them think differently about the choices they've made previously. Mm. Um, and so I think the problem with modern day media is this need for clickbait, the need for advertising revenue, because it is a race to the bottom of who yeah. can get the most clicks, who can get the advertiser revenue in. And to do that, you need more sensationalist headlines. Yeah. You need more clicks. So you don't want people necessarily lingering on one article. You want them clicking on five, six, seven, eight articles. Mm -hmm. So you, you're incentivizing people to have high click through, rate, re click through rates, to engage with content in a different way. As before, when people bought newspapers, they wanted to read them and, mm. and, and absorb that. It's mm. different now. And I think mm. that's when it becomes scary. It really is. I feel like it's becoming a bit of a war. You know, it's a war on the vegan and plant-based lifestyle. But it, and it's all, you know, it's all orientated around money um, sure. and you know, commercial incentive. These companies and industries are multi-billion dollar industries, billion pound industries, whose you know, entire function it exists to you know, use animals consume animals and and keep you know society you know functioning in the same way it is now uh, and obviously we are a huge threat yeah. um and any kind of opportunity to to i guess attack us they take it yeah. you know heather mills is business 30 years uh, it's been producing plant-based and vegan products uh, unfortunately she recently went into liquidation and the media coverage I was analyzing it this week was unbelievable. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, the more left leaning media, media, the more liberal media is more respectful. It focuses on the facts and it focuses on what's happened. It talks about potential reasons, whereas the more right leaning media is is uh, going for the jugular. Yeah. Talking about the end of veganism. Yes. You know, you know, the one of the the queen the queen bees of veganism has fallen. You know, these kind of very aggressive language using it as an opportunity to drive further bias into society and, and kind of show people, oh, look, you see, we were right all along that this yeah. vegan fad is coming to an end. Never mind the fact that there's more vegans today than there's ever been and more people eating plant-based diets. And just because people can't afford to buy plant-based meats, you know, and let's talk about subsidies for a sec. If you go into a supermarket and you pick up a back pack of um, pork bacon, it's about six British pounds per kilogram. Vegan bacon is twenty nine pounds per kilogram. Right, it's not a level playing field. No, you know. So when the industry, meat industry, goes, oh look, you know, veganism is failing because plant based products are failing. What about Brexit? What about you know economic downturn? You know, COVID. All these things have affected the economic system, the machine of our country. Yeah. And to point a finger at you know some failing plant based brands and say, oh, veganism is failing because people aren't buying these products. It's a bit of a, like a, a misdirect, it's like, it's a bait and switch, it, not bait and switch, it's a, um, it's misdirected, isn't it? It's yeah. a completely cloaked attempt to to derail the the support in the movement, isn't it? Absolutely, I mean, it is. It's, I think when people view veganism as being about certain plant-based brands, yeah. it overlooks what veganism is about. <laughs> and, and also overlooks the fact, I mean, I don't, I don't know about yourself, but. I don't really eat many alternatives. Yeah. I don't. I don't buy vegan bacon very rarely. I don't. I don't eat many Beyond Burgers. Yeah. And I think a lot of vegans don't. No, you know, because don't. as vegans, we we. I mean, a lot of us try to eat kind of whole foods, plant based. Mm -hmm. So you know, the sales of fruits and vegetables don't determine the popularity of veganism, and, and yeah. neither do the sales of Beyond Burgers. And I think, I think it is a very comfortable narrative 
for certain media outlets to run with. Oh, well, look, a couple of plant-based companies aren't doing so well. A couple have gone into administration. Is it, but there's also a diversification of the market. Mm. I mean, I hate to say it, but some of these products aren't very good and they shouldn't be being sold because yeah. they're not up to the standard that we, we need them to be and that they yeah. should be. And I think there's a complacency within some plant-based companies to think, well, vegans will buy them. Mm. And I think that there is now a, a realization that with the increasing competition and the increasing need for these products to develop, some of these companies will fall to the wayside. And that isn't inherently a bad thing. Mm. It's just the market changing and evolving and hopefully mm. getting better. Mm. But I think one of the things you discussed previously, which is important, is this isn't just an issue in terms of the things we've discussed. It's part of the culture wars problem now. Mm. And I think that when you look at how so many social issues have now been reduced to just... Um, these monologues on late night TV or the war on, on woke, the war on woke and how we've just exactly, we've reduced important social issues mm. to just these um, reductive arguments that are, are more about drawing laughs mm. and kind of finger pointing than they are about having meaningful debates. It, it's no wonder. It's all a distraction, isn't it? All a distraction. Yeah. But then you've got to look at well, what are the reasons behind this? And you mm. think about, well, look what's happened in the Netherlands recently. You know, this far right politician being voted in for the first time. He's been on the, the outskirts of politics for, for decades, or at least the time that he's been involved. And now all of a sudden he's won the most votes in, in, in a Dutch election, a country which we normally view as being fairly progressive, Very, yeah. right? Mm. And then we think about why. Well, it's because of these environmental measures about reducing animal farming to, you know, bring the nitrogen crisis in line. And you see that actually there's this huge right wing pushback and there's this war on woke, so to speak, because it's attacking certain progressive values that we all need. Mm. And if you look at the sort of the left and, and right breakdown and demographic breakdown, the US is another prime example. Mm. When you look at the popular vote, the left leaning party, which isn't left leaning, leaning enough, of course, but the left leaning party always wins the popular vote, or at least has in, in more recent elections. And yet the, the times that they actually win the White House are, are not necessarily in alignment with that. Mm. And it's because there's a system that's set up to try and weaponize these ideas, which many people in society don't disagree with. And actually the majority of people tend to agree with, mm. but they're weaponized in such a way as to create division so that these right-wing parties and right-wing outlets yeah. stay relevant in the world where actually demographically in many countries, they're becoming increasingly irrelevant. Mm. How do we how do we get past that? Well, I suppose we have to turn our back on these organizations and challenge them where we can. Mm. But then the problem is they feed into this narrative in such an effective way they that they, they begin to overstate their importance and they begin to seem more um, powerful and influential than they, than they ought to be. Mm. And that becomes a really dangerous problem because we have a breakdown, not just of social ideas, but of political conversation. Mm. And now all of a sudden we have politicians like Suella Braverman when she was in office who were appealing to a form of um, you know political conversation which is so toxic, but mm. also is divisive and divisive in a way that the British public and indeed many publics in many countries aren't even asking for. Mm. But we're trapped in this system, this race to the mm. bottom. And veganism, unfortunately, has been enveloped within this culture wars race mm. to the bottom and is now part of the woke agenda, part of the yeah. environmental agenda to limit freedoms and rights. And plant-based meat, well, that's going to kill you and feminize you. And <laughs> yeah. it's been run by big ag and they want Bill to- Bill Gates. Build, oh gosh, you don't even get me started on poor Bill. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's endless, isn't it? I do think that one of the things we struggle to get past is people love to eat meat yeah. and that's why vegan meats were created because people like the taste and the mouthfeel of these types of foods but you know this war on ultra processed has been so successful over the last few years and it's really ramped up over the last couple of years where this has been focused on plant-based meats are unhealthy because look at the 29 different ingredients. Never mind the fact that 29 of those, 28 of those ingredients are all just made from plants. Take, take methyl cellulose, for example. Yeah. It's just plant cellulose. It's methylated plant cellulose. Yeah. And animal ag will, you know, in, especially in the US, they'll create a narrative that this is a, a, a mystery ingredient that's found in laxatives and, you know. Yeah. They don't say vegan burgers are going to give you laxative effects, but that's what they're suggesting. Right. And they create this fear. I saw, uh, you know, a few years ago, I saw this meme that had like a beef burger on one side and it said ingredients beef. Yeah. And then a vegan burger and it had like all the 29 different ingredients. I mean, in the UK, there's a lot less. We have cleaner labels in the UK. We have a lot less preservatives and additives. Um but how do we how do how do we combat that as a, as as um, advocates? I guess the argument is, vegan burgers, vegan meats are unhealthy. Animal meat is healthy because it's natural. Yeah. Well, I, I sometimes hear this 
and it, this, this phrase, don't eat anything that you can't pronounce. Right. Oh, so just about all the different vitamins and minerals that we need to be healthy. If you look at the names of these vitamins, some of them are, you know, you look at them and go, oh my goodness, how do I break this one down? Cyanocobalamin. Right, exactly. Or alpha linolenic acid, you know, and the, the, these are essential vitamins yeah. and minerals that we yeah, need. Yeah. So the idea that we, sh if we can't pronounce something, we shouldn't consume it is, is yeah. ridiculous. And it is frustrating. Now, look, don't get me wrong. We, we shouldn't say that plant-based alternatives are, uh, you know, are, are objectively healthy. Mm. And we shouldn't make the claim that they should trying to get healthier mm. you know we should try and make food as healthy as possible within obviously within the boundaries that we have because the problem with plant-based alternatives is they get beaten up twice they get beaten up for not tasting like animal products mm. and they get beaten up for not being healthy so there's this this weird situation where a, a you know a, a, a plant-based alternative burger is criticized for not being as healthy as a chickpea and mushroom you know quinoa disc. stew yeah a disc. <laughs> i love that exactly it's criticized for not being as healthy as that mm. so they, they, they but that's but the reason for that is because they want to make it taste and, you know, replicate meat. Mm. And then, you know, they do that and they get criticized for not being healthy or, or they're healthy and get, get, get criticized for not replicating meat. Mm. So I, look, don't get me wrong. I do think that plant-based alternatives should strive to be healthier where, where they can, reducing salt levels, increasing fiber, increasing, um, you know, the nutrition overall. An interesting thing came up from the WHO recently, I think a couple of weeks ago now, at the time that we're recording, and it was looking at different processed foods. And it said of all the different processed foods that you can get, processed meat's the worst, mm. you know? And actually pr processed plant-based alternatives are among the healthiest processed foods that you mm. can consume. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously they're not the healthiest foods. They're not, sure. they're not whole plant foods. Yeah. But the idea that they're the most unhealthy foods you can consume is, is completely yeah. a product of, of misinformation. Absolutely. And it, it's troubling how now this narrative is emerging that red meat is the ultimate food. Mm. Just, I've heard it. Red meat is a superfood, is, is what I've been hearing. And haven't you heard all, all, oh, the, all of the research, the hundreds of studies mm. showing that red meat is correlated with increased heart disease, increased type yeah. 2 diabetes risk, increase of colon cancer, all of these things. No, they're all wrong, mm. completely wrong, because there was a study three or four years ago now, which was funded by, by you know, uh, organizations with links to, to the meat industry and was carried out by a, you know, a hired scientist who's done work for the sugar industry and mm. done work for other nefarious industries. Oh, well, he did a study that said actually it wasn't true. So now all of a sudden, all of this research, these hundreds of different studies uh, are completely invalidated and false because of this one guy called Bradley Johnson who did this one study that apparently shows us that red meat isn't even unhealthy mm. for us, right? So... In answer to your question, which I've kind of forgotten a little bit, but uh, about plant-based alternatives, I, look, I, I think that we just have to be we just have to be more critical thinkers, and we have to think. Look, there may be a long list of ingredients, but yep. the important thing is what are those ingredients? Are and then mm. beef overlooks the fact that within beef there are so many different elements to it, from the heme ion to the saturated fat, the cholesterol, the hormones, the, exactly the hormones, bovine like, viruses. Well, well, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the hundred percent beef on BSC as well, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So it it is weird how again reductively we label things and i saw a, a kind of a funny counterpoint to that and it was, had a beyond burger and it said 100 percent beyond meat and then mm. had beef and it listed all the different components found within beef and um I thought, so funny it's funny yeah. i mean it's the appeal to nature fallacy isn't it yeah that because something appears natural mm. it means that it's good for you well yeah. snake poison is natural yeah. it's not good for you so it's anthrax, isn't it? Yeah. You know, there's plenty of natural things that God forbid we don't want yeah. to have around and, us. And also this idea, it's you see it a lot as well. Oh, it's made of chemicals. Yeah. Well, honey, you are made of chemicals. <laughs> yeah. If you broke down the human body, there would be thousands of different chemicals that you're made up of. Yeah. You know, including some things you've never heard of and you probably couldn't pronounce either. Right. Yeah. So this idea that just because you can't pronounce it, I love that, just because you can't pronounce it doesn't mean that you shouldn't eat it. Everything yeah. is made of chemicals. Yeah. George Monbiot did this thing and it was I think it was in response to Michael Pollan, and Michael Pollan says, Don't eat anything that your grandma wouldn't have eaten or something. Yeah. And George Monbiot's like listing like bananas and all these different foods that, you know, a hundred years ago, however long he's referencing when he's his great grand or whatever, people don't have access to. Oh, so we shouldn't eat any of those foods. We should have like, you know, basically the foods that we could have grown in England at that mm. time when we had less food accessibility and availability. Mm. There's all of these romanticized ideals of, of going back to the past, mm. of how agriculture used to be, how food yeah. production used to be. It used to be so holistic and wonderful and, and idealistic. And firstly, that, that was never the case. But secondly, it overlooks the fact that, well, well, actually, that's not really what's important to this conversation. I think there is this hijacking that's gone on now around nutrition um, and around what it means to be healthy and how to get nutrition. And I think that there is this strange 
I suppose it. I suppose it's, it's natural. Veganism kind of had a bit of a free reign for a few years. We had a, we had a little good, you know, 2016 to 2019. I feel like were, the, were some good years. You know, <laughs> it was the rise of veganism, the vegan boom, and then it was only natural that these industries would get their act together, find out what works, mm. disseminate that information, and then the carnivore diet arises as kind of like. Um, you know, counterpoint to veganism. It's like the the other end, the extreme at the other end, so to speak, of just eating meat. It's like the ultimate, haha, let's take vegans down. We're only going to eat red meat and liver, you know, for example. So I, I think that there is this natural ebb and flow that will occur. It's this kind of push and pull scenario where one thing happens, there's something that, that comes up to try and counterbalance that. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's part of societal progression happening. But more increasingly, we've seen this kind of delve into the conspiracy world, you know, and plant-based food and vegans and have become very much tied in, in some minds to this conspiratorial way of thinking. Yeah. And that is when it, it transcends beyond rationality. How has that happened? How has eating plants and saving animals become embedded in this idea that there's a deep state that's trying to feminize us all? And what's your theories on like where that comes from? Who is propagating this notion that eating plants is some kind of demonic act or something, you know, why is it, you know, it's, if we go back like, you know, 50, 60 years, a lot of, you know, the vegan family on the BBC and, you know, all these magazine articles, it's written in such positive ways and people really shine a, a good light on people living and eating this way. But in the last, like, you know, few decades, there has been a total, is it just the internet? Is it these dark rabbit warrens on the internet where people make stuff up just for fun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the internet definitely has a mm. has a, a, a huge role in this. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly where it comes from. I think mm. I think a lot of the a lot of the idea around it is tied in with kind of traditional, old fashioned, right. harking back to the way with you know things used to be. Yeah. Again, in the Netherlands, there was a kind of a big conspiracy around the whole removal of you know a thirty percent reduction in in ruminant animals and, mm. and red meat production was kind of tied in with, with another conspiracy around great replacement, about getting an influx of refugees yeah. in, providing them places to live, to throw off this this Western culture. There's a lot of overlap between different conspiratorial and, and um, very dangerous far-right ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason that veganism has been tied in with that is because it is being viewed as kind of like an environmental progressive agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think that the tying, of ve tying in of veganism with the environment has led it to becoming open to conspiracy ways of thinking, you know, the removal of rights, the yeah. links with the 15 minute city and the ultra low emission zones and how that's, you know, stamping good, honest working people into the dust to prioritize big companies that want to fill us with processed chemicals, blah, 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 blah. So it's hard to know exactly where it stems from, but I think it comes again through this, this this perpetuation of the fear narrative, you know, oh, well, actually plants are harmful for you. They're filled of anti-nutrients and this is all a way to get you feminized. Phytates. And ph <laughs> phytates and oxalates and yeah, and it's a way to subjugate yeah. you. It's about powerlessness. And mm. I think that a, a lot of conspiracy is about powerlessness. It's mm. about making people feel like they're gonna have uh, control taken from yeah. their lives, that they're, they're gonna have no agency, no authority. And I think this plant narrative is, is being put into that because historically we viewed meat as being affluence mm. and power and prosperity right. and plants. So you're taking that away from people exactly. by giving them vegetables. Exactly, you're taking away a symbol of power and affluence and agency and prosperity. Yeah. So the counter to that is subjugation and fear and a, a lack of control. Interesting, you know? mm. that's so interesting.